All right, well, we're going to go ahead and officially get started. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Beth Martin. I'm a teaching professor and director of the climate change program here at Washington University. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us this evening, and I especially want to thank our panelists, Congresswoman Cori Bush, who will be joining us via video, Ashlyn Busick, Senior Regional Representative of the Socially Responsible Agricultural Project, Sal Martinez, the Chief Executive of Employment Connection, and Rachel Owen, the Executive Director of Most Policy Initiative. Um, as we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of basic webinar functions. Questions to the panelists can be sent to the moderator, the keynote speaker and panelists through the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Please ask questions, ask as many questions as you want. We'd like this to be interactive and we want to make sure that we're able to, to talk about and address some of the things that are on your mind this evening. So as we more formally get started tonight, the Climate Change Program has partnered with the University of Missouri, St. Louis and the Bard Center to engage in a discussion about green recovery, climate solutions and a just transition through this Solve Climate by 2030 webinar. This webinar is part of a larger series of webinars hosted across the United States and in other countries. So these webinars are on the same topic are being hosted in many different places and many conversations around these issues. So we're going to open today with a welcome by Eben, Go Eben Goodstein, the director of the Bard Center for Environmental Policy, whose leadership has led to this event. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. 
Don't take no for an answer. Ask them, why not? This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you, thousands of leaders like you around the world, asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked, Global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goodstein, for creating and sharing that video with us and for setting up this series that we were able to participate in last year and again this year. Um, as we know and we heard, climate change is one of the most important, complex, and disruptive challenges that we face with differential impacts on people, nations, and ecosystems across the planet. It's a, it's a challenge that takes courage to work together and to address. To that end, Missouri has the potential to play a key role in the coming critical decade by lowering emissions, creating a thriving green economy, and ensuring a just and equitable transition that does, does not leave any of our rural, suburban, urban, or indigenous communities behind. At WashU, we prioritize these conversations like we're having tonight, and along, and we're Along with the climate change program, both the university and the climate change program, we're committed to engaging our community as partners in addressing these challenges. So I'm now honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Representative Corey Bush. Um, as I mentioned, Representative Bush had a last minute scheduling conflict and is not able to join us in person. However, she did take the time to, to tape comments to share with us and to, and to start off our conversation. And we really, really appreciate her being willing to do that. So I also wanna take the time to provide an introduction for her as if she were here with us. So as the US government re-engages the world on climate change and Congress considers President Bush's infrastructure proposal, Congresswoman Bush will be in the middle of many, many important discussions about the policies and programs our nation will put in place to address our changing climate. Climate change is a global problem, but a large portion of the solutions will require us to focus on the impact to local communities and individuals. Because of Representative Bush's background as a registered nurse, community activist, and organizer, and ordained pastor, she has a unique and well-experienced voice at the table. In the short time since being sworn in as the first Black woman and first nurse to represent Missouri in the House of Representatives, Congresswoman Bush has become one of the most sought after speakers on campus, and we're really appreciative of her generosity with her time and her leadership in addressing so many important issues. So thank you, Representative Bush, for creating this video and for being with us here virtually this evening and starting our conversation. Thank you to Washington University for having me and to Bard College for organizing this series. We need many more classes and events like this one. Wash you, you are family, and it is so good to be in virtual community with you all this evening. Today, I want to talk about taking climate action with urgency and with a lens towards justice, because here in St. Louis, that is what our community needs. We have a shared goal of hitting the 2030 target date, and that is a huge priority for our region. And in order to get there, we need to maximize federal support for the environmental challenges that we face in our community. 
there are 11 more 90 degree days per year in St. Louis than when I was born. And that number will continue to grow. Flooding that spreads potentially radioactive water from Coldwater Creek is common already. And climate change will make this grave racial justice issue worse each year. Those are just some of the reasons why, as we are fighting for environmental justice in all forms, climate action must remain at the center of our collective work. I know this firsthand. The townhouse I lived in by Coldwater Creek used to flood frequently before I moved, putting my child at risk of danger because it was near his own bedroom. When I was unhoused and living in my car, rising temperatures made it even less safe for my children and me as the windows replicated the greenhouse effect on a small scale. When I did have housing, I was often unable to afford to turn on the air conditioning in the hot St. Louis summers. I can remember that feeling viscerally. It is not a coincidence that I carry these experiences as a Black woman. It is not a coincidence that Black women are leading the fight for climate justice either. We are fighting for our very safety and survival. My experiences at home in St. Louis have directly influenced my legislative work in Congress. They've led to my crucial partnership with Senator Ed Markey in introducing the Environmental Justice Mapping Act in January. We must reinforce what we already know with data that can guide targeted federal spending to our communities, the ones that suffer the most from our climate crisis. As I fight for 100% renewable energy by 2030, I am constantly told that that goal is naive or it's impossible. But the people of St. Louis, of Ferguson, of Normandy, of Florissant, and communities all across Missouri's first district cannot wait around for what establishment politicians think is reasonable. Failing to act urgently is unreasonable. Again, failing to act urgently is unreasonable. A 2013 study in the Journal of Power Sources showed that current renewable technologies could power up to 99% of the electrical grid if combined properly. We can do this and we must do this. We know that most people work on deadlines and Congress of course is the same way. I would like to know when the students listening today will start an essay that is due in 2030, 2040, or 2050. Probably not tomorrow, just like how Congress won't act on climate now for 2040 deadlines. Any later than 2030 would be disastrous for climate. But even with this ambitious goal, we need strategies to act sooner. We need to focus on 2030 and then set intermediate targets and goals accounting for the political landscape. For example, we should try to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions for all federally owned buildings by 2022. And this is 2021, right? We need to be as close to that target as possible while Democrats control both chambers of Congress and the White House and before our government officials are sucked into the next campaign cycle. The year 2030 is our target for local climate solutions in Northeast Missouri too. The just transition we need will require huge targeted investments to mitigate and prepare for the climate crisis. To achieve climate justice for Missouri's first district, we first need to gather more data on environmental justice and map it so that we can fully understand and demonstrate how different injustices are intersecting. This work will build on the incredible locally developed environmental racism in St. Louis report from 2017 so that we can make the case for the resources and investments that black and brown and indigenous communities so urgently need. As we gather and map those data to ensure at least half of federal investments go into frontline communities, we need to target the investments towards real climate and environmental justice solutions. We are working on legislation now to federally fund local projects in renewable energy, energy efficiency, lead and mold remediation, and other projects that will clean our air and water 
even while reducing harmful emissions from greenhouse gases that are largely burned in black and brown communities. President Biden recently proposed the American Jobs Plan, which would replace all lead pipes, expand access to clean water and broadband service, and retrofit our schools and housing infrastructure, among other investments. It is a bold start, but $2 trillion over eight years falls short in investments we've been calling for to achieve the transformative changes we need to combat this crisis. As we target investments, I am working to transform the very structures of how we live. Historically, government officials have created a status quo where access to basic utilities and services has become increasingly out of reach for the working class and people of low income. So I am fighting to make electricity, clean water and sewage and broadband basic human rights for everyone to enjoy. Bringing utilities into public ownership is just one example of how we can set up our system to work for people and the planet. Together, we will fight to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030, even when so many tell us we can't. We are going to decarbonize this economy and create millions of jobs in the process. And we are going to do it together as a fundamental part of our campaign for racial justice and climate justice. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bush. Um, really, like I said before, it's really inspiring to be able to hear her remarks. And I look forward to the rest of our conversation as we start to get into details and thoughts on strategies and policies that we can take locally uh, here in St. Louis and across the state throughout Missouri. So I am gonna turn the conversation over to Nina Silverstein. Nina is one of our amazing students here at WashU. She's an environmental analysis major from Hastings on Hudson, New York. So Nina, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Beth. I am pleased to be joined by Sal Martinez, Ashlyn Busick, and Dr. Rachel Owen for this upcoming segment to discuss key policy initiatives to, ad to address climate change and enhance climate resilience in Missouri. We will explore the need to provide support for individuals facing limit limiting opportunities so that they can achieve self-sufficiency. We will also discuss the need for policies in support of farmers and on-farm clean energy creation. Finally, we will delve into the importance of, of effective climate communication in implementing climate policies. I'm going to begin by introducing our first panelist, Sal Martinez. Sal Martinez was appointed to the position of CEO of Employment Connection in November of 2018 after a distinguished career in place-based community development. Employment Connection's mission is to assist individuals with limited opportunities to self-sufficiency, and it currently serves thousands of clients on an annual, annual basis, including justice-involved individuals, single mothers with children, military veterans, and the unhoused. Martinez has received numerous community service awards and serves on a number of civic boards, including St. Louis Housing Authority, Civil Rights Enforcement Agency, and the Community Builders Network. Welcome, Sal. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Nina. And I will attempt to share my screen here. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity uh, to address this distinguished uh, body uh, this evening. Uh, very, very excited to uh, be in a position to uh, serve the community. And at this time, uh, I certainly have the unenviable task of speaking after the Honorable Congresswoman Cori Bush, but I'll certainly do the best I can. Uh, as Nina mentioned, I'm the CEO of Employment Connection. We've been serving the St. Louis region now for over 40 years. And we're very excited to now be uh, in the, if I can use a sports metaphor, uh, the game of green jobs. So I'm just going to share a brief PowerPoint uh, with some information about our agency. Uh, our foundational principles are to empower, employ, and inspire. Uh, we strive to put our clients in a position of being self-sufficient. Who are our clients? Uh, traditionally, about half of our clients are identified as justice involved. Uh, some people would refer to them as ex-offenders. 
These are individuals who have made a mistake or two uh, in their past, and we believe that they deserve an opportunity to move forward with their lives uh, after they have paid their debt to society. Uh, we serve individuals who are unemployed, underemployed, uh, that are receiving public assistance, uh, such as TANF, SNAP, perhaps they're living in subsidized housing. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a growing population of unhoused uh, individuals. Um, we uh, serve a lot of at-risk uh, youth and young adults, veterans, uh, non-custodial fathers, et cetera. Traditionally, over 90% uh, of our clients are identified uh, as minorities, even though we are an equal opportunity employer and service provider. Uh, on the right side uh, of this slide are just a, a few uh, factoids. Uh, unfortunately, in the state of Missouri, uh, African-Americans are uh, incarcerated four times more often than Caucasians. Uh, as taxpayers, uh, we now know that it costs over $30,000 a year to incarcerate an individual in the state of Missouri. And unfortunately, Black residents are three times more likely to live in areas of concentrated poverty. So what do we do to set the stage for our clients to become self-sufficient? Uh, we are most known for our ability to recruit uh, and train individuals to enter the workforce uh, through a number uh, of ways, including providing soft skills and a number of other wraparound services. As part of their journey, we also um, uh, teach them about financial uh, empowerment, repairing their credit, establishing their credit. And we try to be as much of a one-stop shop for our clients as we can be. Uh, if they work up the faith, the, the gumption uh, to enter our doors or to contact us via phone or, or email, we want to give them whatever they need uh, while they are here. We don't want to turn them around and send them to other agencies unnecessarily. Uh, we want to give them everything that they need uh, if we can. And so some of our in-house uh, services include minimum behavioral health counseling. Uh, it includes eviction. Uh, prevention assistance, rental, mortgage, utility assistance. We certainly want to keep our clients housed. We also provide rapid rehousing placement services, again, for our clients who are uh, currently unhoused. We provide clothing assistance, transportation assistance, access to food, uh, PPE supplies now uh, as we navigate during the pandemic, et cetera. Uh, the magic to our work is really about the relationships that our staff have with our clients as it relates to job training and placement, each client is assigned a career specialist who becomes their champion, their mentor, their advocate, their big brother, their big sister, their conduit uh, along their journey uh, to self-sufficiency. So we had the uh, pleasure of entering uh, the uh, green career uh, arena uh, a few months ago as we worked with several partners to uh, institute a pilot solar panel installation training program and this um, program arrived after uh, work that uh, many partners, and I, I have to uh, tip my cap to uh, Catherine Werner, the city of St. Louis, um, as part of the American Cities uh, Climate Challenge uh, initiative that the city of St. Louis uh, was very involved with. Uh, in the middle column, uh, you'll see that one of the priorities was to establish uh, a pilot program uh, that would promote diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the regional green economy. And so Catherine and her partners reached out to Employment Connection to see if we wanted to play a role uh, in this effort. And along with that, we were introduced to a host of wonderful partners, uh, many of whom you see on this particular slide. This is by no means an all exhaustive list. Uh, additional organizations have contacted us uh, in the past few months to see what they can do to support this effort, uh, including uh, Ameren, Missouri. Uh, who uh, recently provided us with funding that will uh, allow us to launch an additional cohort. Uh, as part of this initial pilot program, uh, we devised a number of services that we would make available uh, to the participants, uh, including uh, soft skills, uh, preparing them for the workforce, uh, exposing them to uh, companies uh, that are in the solar industry, in this case, straight up solar um, and azimuth energy, uh, we assigned them a career specialist who's again served as a mentor. Uh, this uh, career specialist that uh, was assigned to this program has had a distinguished career in construction. Uh, and so he was very familiar with the industry and uh, terminology, et cetera. 
Uh, they did receive technical training uh, during the pilot uh, program. Some of them also received additional hands-on training. And again, we were there to provide them with whatever wraparound services they needed to complete this program. For some, that was uh, transportation assistance. For some, uh, it was clothing assistance. For some, it was equipment assistance. So again, we want to provide our clients with whatever they need along their journey to self-sufficiency. So a little bit about uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, again, we provided the soft skills training and participant support, uh, both Azimuth and Straight Up Solar uh, provided uh, training uh, both virtually and in person. Uh, then our partners at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and uh, NECA provided the intro to solar voltaic training uh, at their location on Hampton in the city of St. Louis. Uh, our friends at Building uh, Union Diversity provided OSHA 10 training uh, and certification uh, for the participants. And then several of the participants were offered additional paid internships by Straight Up Solar. Uh, and then several of them then applied uh, to uh, the IBW uh, apprenticeship program. They were so excited about their experience during the training program, they decided that they wanted to pursue careers uh, with the union. And then of course, we're big on retention here at Employment Connection. Once our training uh, programs end, we don't cut the cord. We stay in touch with them. We wanna see if there's any support we can provide them, any advice, uh, anything that we can do to help them continue to move forward uh, in their lives. Uh, we conducted uh, post, uh, pre and post uh, surveys uh, with the participants. So these are just uh, a few of the uh, categories uh, that we measure um, with the uh, participants. A majority of the, uh, of the participants were minority. We did have several females uh, in the program as well. Uh, as far as the post uh, surveys went, uh, the clients told us that they were very, very excited about the soft skills training that they received along with the OSHA 10 training. Uh, they did tell us they wanted more uh, hands-on training. Um, of course, part of that was compromised because of COVID-19, but they, as things are, are opening up, uh, our partners have told us that they will uh, allow the participants to have more uh, hands-on training. Uh, we did provide uh, stipends uh, for the participants uh, in this program and uh, through uh, additional funding that we have received, we will continue to be able to do that. Straight Up Solar also provided uh, paid internships beyond uh, the initial um, training program for the participants. So that was very, very uh, helpful. Uh, return on investment. Um, as an agency uh, between 2012 and 2000. 20, uh, we have placed over 4,000 of our clients into the workforce uh, with an average wage of just a little under $11 an hour, which has contributed over $11 million to the local economy. This is important when you compare it to the other statistic that says that taxpayers uh, like us uh, pay almost $30,000 a year to keep um, an individual incarcerated. And so we want our clients on the other side uh, of that, um, that picture where they are actually contributing uh, to the economy. What is really interesting, however, about the pilot uh, solar panel installation program is that the participants receive $15 an hour for their paid internships. And then several of the uh, participants were then ultimately hired uh, by private solar companies at wages starting at uh, 1650 per hour with benefits, uh, which would equate to a starting salary of over $34,000 uh, a year uh, for a uh, individual who is just entering uh, this domain uh, that would certainly have uh, a tremendous amount of room for advancement. And so based on these figures, based on the expansion uh, of uh, this type of work, green jobs work in this community, uh, we're very excited to be in a position to help establish a pipeline for minorities and women uh, to enter this very, very exciting field. Uh, I will say again, we're very proud that about 50% of the clients that we serve are justice involved. Uh, several of our staff at Employment Connection are justice involved. That's done intentionally. Not only are we an equal opportunity employer, but we wanna always make sure that we have staff that can relate to the lived experiences of our clients. 
And one of the things that I'm very proud about is that University of Missouri Columbia a few years ago uh, did a study where they um, they they uh, conducted research on 39 agencies that uh, work with uh, justice involved clients, and we were found to have the lowest reoffense uh, rate in the state. And again, uh, I really attribute that to the level uh, of the relationships that our staff form with these clients. We are committed to give them everything that they need to be successful. And so with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Sal. Um, next, I am happy to introduce Ashlyn Busick. Um, Sorry, okay. Ashlyn Busick grew up on a family farm in northern Missouri next to one of the state's largest corporate hog operations. Her family's ongoing battle for justice and advocacy for family farms led her to the socially responsible agriculture project, which she works as a senior regional representative for Missouri and the surrounding states. In addition to working with communities, Ashlyn has a growing passion for permaculture and healthy soil education, which she practices as the director of the local community garden. Welcome, Ashlyn. Thank you so much. And I just want to say I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. Um, oh, sorry, I need some slides. <laughs> I'll wait. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and move on to the next one for me. Thank you. Okay, so the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. We are a nonprofit uh, and we empower people to protect their communities from the impacts of factory farms or concentrated animal feeding operations um, and uh, to advocate for socially responsible food futures. Um, just a, a bit of personal history of uh, the little blonde girl down there in the corner is me. Um, as Nina already mentioned a little bit, uh, I, I grew up on the front lines of this struggle. Uh, my community organized back in 1994 to oppose a massive corporate hog operation that was built near our farm. Um, so I have experienced firsthand the long, difficult struggle, not only to protect our land, air, and water, but also to make your concerns heard when you're standing in the shadow of a giant corporation. Uh, and so that's what I, that's why I do what I do today, to help others in similar situations when the cards seem to be stacked against them. Um, and that's why I also really appreciate that we're here today to talk about a just transition toward climate solutions. So what are we hoping to accomplish with this focus on CAFOs and why am I talking to you about those uh, when we're supposed to be talking about climate solutions? Um, I want to share with you the status quo of our current system uh, because our policy is still funneling so much investment into making this model work when we believe it's holding us back from the farming future that we need. So SRAP's vision and what I want to convey as the policy change we need to see here in Missouri is to help communities begin to replace extractive industrial livestock production with pasture-based systems that replenish the land and revitalize our rural economies. And speaking within the context of climate solutions, we believe we need to transfer the power from the handful of corporations that dominate the agricultural narrative and shift support to more small diversified farms which have the ability to adapt in times of crisis and also build healthier ecosystems to sink more carbon into our soils. So concentrated animal feeding operations, they can find thousands of animals and millions of gallons of waste, pollute air and waterways which threaten public health, and really the entire cycle from producing and trucking feed to manure generation and final slaughter contributes greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. Socially responsible agriculture, on the other hand, values ecologically sound practices, socially equitable systems that support inclusivity, access to land and food, human health and quality jobs, economically viable farming models, resiliency through diversity and improved soil health, and the ability to store carbon in those soils. So what's happening in Missouri on this front? Farming communities like mine are still struggling for stronger protections from CAFOs, and there is this ongoing deregulation of those facilities and an ongoing feud about the future of ag in our state. Uh, in addition to dealing with those negative impacts of such operations, 
farmers are also battling in their own production uh, with the increasing unpredictability from season to season due to climate change. And we seem to have uh, a lack of leadership from our state on both climate resiliency and on ag as a climate solution. Um, uh, the Department of Ag is not focusing on climate change impacts. Uh, Missouri is currently suing President Biden over his executive order on tackling the climate crisis in part because of the regulation that it would place on ag. And then we have the ag industry offering up a false solution in the form of biogas, uh, which we call factory farm gas. So this, this method captures methane from manure storage for use as gas. It's complex and expensive and it requires tax dollars. Um, it is incentivizes bigger animal numbers and therefore more manure production, which in turn increases the pollution potential and it diverts funding from true renewable energy. This is still an investment in gas and the associated infrastructure. And so I wanted to just draw your attention to that because we are seeing a growing push for it across the country. And we really need to consider uh, this following slide here. In the search for climate solutions, we cannot disregard impacts to neighboring communities and we cannot continue to prop up systems that are harmful and extractive to those communities. So the policy that we don't need, there are so many potential solutions we could work toward, uh, especially within agriculture. However, in our day to day and in Missouri, we see more efforts to keep a flawed system afloat. Uh, and this is what we see bring, being promoted year after year. And it's not the solution. Uh, factory farm gas schemes, like I just mentioned, tax, tax dollars going to best management practices that should already be a requirement. Restrictions on local control over CAFO regulation and reduced permitting requirements for CAFO emissions and manure management. And some of those things I may get to elaborate on later. I'm trying to cover a lot in a very general sense. The policy that we do need uh, that would have far reaching benefits beyond just climate change solutions. Um, funding for conservation and carbon farming practices. Missouri does have some cost share programs for conservation, uh, but in my opinion, we're not doing enough to encourage practices that we know drive down carbon, uh, like silvopasture and agroforestry. We need more support for beginning small and medium sized farms. The Department of Ag did utilize pandemic aid to offer grants to help small processors increase capacity. Uh, which is great. Let's do more of that and, and let's do it beyond just pandemic response. Uh, there are some loan options there as well for small processors. On farm clean energy creation. So the federal REAP program through USDA provides funding for this, uh, but what can we do in Missouri? There are some really interesting strategies out there, including something called agrivoltaics, which is where you raise a product right alongside your solar panels. Uh, and we also need limitations on corporate control and foreign ownership uh, because when so few, com so few companies uh, own our food supply, they set the practice and they write the rules through their powerful lobby. And there are even lawsuits happening right now arguing that they're manipulating the market and fixing the price. So what can we do? First things first, please find your farmer. There are several organizations out there trying to help connect you with farmers that are already doing this great work. And I have just listed a few here. Uh, you can connect with our Regional Food Policy Council. It seems to me anyway that a lot of the positive food system policy is being developed at the local levels through food policy councils. And these tend to be in more urban areas, but this trend is spreading. Uh, Senator Doug Beck has proposed a bill to curb and track foreign ownership of Missouri farmland, Senate Bill 243. Uh, I believe it's currently still in committee that they have had a hearing on it. Um, and if time allows later, I can elaborate on why foreign ownership is a, um, not ideal. Uh, let's see, I would encourage you to learn more about Senator Booker and Representative Khanna's proposed bills called the Farm System Reform Act, uh, which proposes a phase out of CAFOs and offers debt forgiveness and funding to help producers transition out of that model. And also please join the SRAP Food and Farm Network, which is launching uh, toward the end of this year 
to advocate for socially responsible agriculture policy. Uh, we're very excited to be, to be developing a new program that will not only help communities protect themselves from CAFOs, but will engage them in policy work toward that farm future that we want and need. So like I said, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of very general information. I look forward to more discussion. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Ashlyn. Um, and finally, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rachel Owen. Dr. Rachel Owen is the director and co-founder of Missouri Science and Technology Policy Initiative based in Jefferson City, Missouri, where she works to connect science and policy across the state of Missouri. Rachel holds a PhD in soil science and serves as an adjunct fac faculty member in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. Additionally, Rachel was recently appointed as a member of the Jefferson City Environmental Quality Commission and volunteers with, with Climate Action Casey, um, Kansas City, Citizens Climate Lobby, and the Soil Science Society of America to promote bipartisan science-based climate solutions. Welcome, Rachel. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, perfect. Um, so as Nina mentioned, um, I am with an organization called Most Policy Initiative or Missouri Science and Technology Policy Initiative. We're a nonprofit based in Jefferson City and we broadly work to connect science and policy across the state. Um, primarily, we work here at the Capitol in Jefferson City talking with lawmakers and answering their questions related to science um, that is is discussed related to pending legislation, um, but we also have a statewide science network called the Local Science Engagement Network, where we work with scientists across the state to help them find ways to elevate science and policy conversations. And again, as um, she mentioned in my introduction, so I work both on a personal level, but um, predominantly on a professional level in trying to help find nonpartisan or bipartisan science-based climate solutions. So typically I'm gonna have my nonpartisan hat on. So if I don't answer questions um, in, in too direct of a way, it's because we, I really am um, trying to find ways to talk about things in a, in a bipartisan or nonpartisan manner. And so I'm gonna start with the ask for tonight. Um, I think that one of the biggest ways that we need are that we can move forward on promoting more climate policy in Missouri is by having more candid conversations about climate change and doing so by finding common ground. So as a soil scientist who worked on climate change for my PhD, I feel really comfortable talking about climate change in most settings, but it's still kind of awkward to talk about climate change at the Capitol in Jefferson City and really across the state of Missouri. And I think a lot of people feel that way. There's just not very many conversations happening that are specifically related to climate change. Of course, we have some exceptions to that at the local level where cities are planning, cities and regions are, are working on climate action planning. But when we're talking about issues here in Jefferson City, we're likely not bringing up the phrase climate change. Policymakers aren't talking about climate change. And this is really, it seems like on both sides of the aisle at the state level, we don't necessarily have a lot of push for climate action. And so the thing that I would encourage uh, you to do today, if you're a scientist, if you're a researcher, or a climate advocate, is really um, take advantage of resources to think about climate communication. Um, and I listed a couple of my favorites here. Um, How We Respond is a video series that's produced by the American Association for Advancement of Science, and it shares success stories of how to talk about climate change. It has a lot of agriculture stories from the Midwest, um, has stories about talking about urban heat islands and different um, problems associated with climate change that are affecting urban areas. Soon there's going to be one from Missouri um, that we're really excited about, but it's a great way to listen to how scientists and communities have come together to talk about climate solutions in an effective way in other scenarios. And then my climate science hero is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Um, she's a climate scientist at Texas Tech University, and she produces a series with PBS called Global Weirding. I think it's a really great way, especially if you're a scientist, it breaks down complex scientific topics in a way that is accessible to non-scientists, to people who may have some doubts about climate change um, and, and can really help to promote effective conversation. And she also um, has a lot of great resources about how to communicate with conservatives about climate change um, and 
and really in general, bring people from different backgrounds together to think about common solutions. So this is gonna be my theme is really thinking about common solutions. Um, and then I'll talk about kind of what we're hearing at the Capitol in Missouri as well. So candid conversations require trust. And so one thing that we really focus on is we are trying to find science-based solutions, bring science into these policy conversations, but that can only happen if you have a trusted relationship with the person you're talking to. It doesn't mean you have to know them and have dinner at their house every Sunday, but you know, there's a lot of science that shows or a lot of research that shows that the knowledge deficit model doesn't work. You can't just give somebody information and assume that they're going to use it. So that dialogue and building trust is really important in being able to provide information that's going to be of use and it's going to be well received by a policymaker. And I think this is something that policymakers themselves um, work with when they're finding bipartisan solutions. They're sitting there and they're trying to come up with ways that they can find compromise um, and still move things forward. And that's something that as scientists or community members communicating with policymakers, it's also an important um, point to remember. And then this is my last slide. Um, now I feel I had this was really long when I practiced it. Now I feel like I'm talking too fast. Um, so uh, please feel free to ask me questions about this later. But so again, um, I'll talk about some climate change themes that we hear at the Capitol or um, surrounding Missouri policy. And I have climate change in quotations here because we don't necessarily really hear climate change talked about too much. However, we do hear a lot about issues that are directly related to climate change. Um, Ashlyn talked about agriculture. Um, there's a lot of priority prioritization of agricultural policy in Jefferson City. Um, so that's an opportunity to bring in climate information, um, energy and environment. Um, energy probably here most closely related to um, mitigation of climate change. But these are all policies that are, you know, being brought up that are going through committees, not on the, you know, premise of climate change, but there are issues that are being talked about where we have the opportunity to bring in information. So related to energy, some of the key topics that we hear about or that we see legislation brought up about. Um, so there's a lot of talk about grid reliability. So this comes up a lot when we're thinking about switching to renewables. Uh, there's a lot of policy, there are lots of policymakers who are still concerned that if we switch to a renewable energy source that that could possibly um, not allow energy to be there when people need it or um, cause power outages and things like that. And so um, we have conversations about grid reliability. Another topic that seems to have a lot of bipartisan support is keeping utility rates low. Um, and so this is, as Representative Bush mentioned earlier in her video, um, utility rates can be outrageous uh, in some urban communities in St. Louis and Kansas City. Um, but also in rural areas. So low income communities are particularly vulnerable to high utility rates, um, often have low energy efficient um, homes and appliances. And so this is an issue that can bring together, you know, Democratic and Republican lawmakers who want to make sure that utilities, utility prices are kept low for their cost, for their constituents. Related to that, um, we're starting to hear more conversations related to market choices. And this is we're hearing this because it's related to keeping energy rates and utility rates low for, cons for customers. So you've probably heard that a lot of our major utilities in the state are looking to switch over to renewable sources. However, uh, well, and that's happening as renewable energy becomes more cost effective and becomes a cheaper source of energy in comparison to coal. But a lot of, of these energy companies also still have coal power plants that are that they need to, I do not understand securitization too well to be able to talk about it, but um, they have these assets that are, are going to be lost if they you know, switch to a different energy source. And so lawmakers are trying to find ways for the utility companies to be able to switch um, to this other market choice, be able to keep utility rates low for their rate payers um, and support them through that transition. And then energy efficiency also tends to be a fairly win-win um, situation um, for bipartisan groups. You save energy and keeps costs low. And then as Ashlyn mentioned also, another topic that's becoming increasingly popular, I think in the last couple years is thinking about biofuels, biodiesels, biogas. So these are products coming off of agricultural production in some capacity that can be incorporated into our fuel system in the state. Um, 
So oftentimes when we're having conversations about these types of policies, so this is something where you know, biodiesel in particular has a lot of support from the agricultural community. And so that allows us, you know, they're talking about the issue. They aren't necessarily talking about it as a climate change solution, but it allows us to come in and, and give information about how biofuels, biodiesel, biogas, how that actually plays into the climate you know, model, how the carbon cycles work in different fuels compared to petroleum fuels and things like that. And then the last thing um, I'd mention here is just some tips for communication um, based on our conversations. And I do want to give a quick shout out to one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Jenny Bradford, who works more on these conversations day to day and helped me compile this list. Um, but one of the things uh, that is maybe a misconception is that we don't necessarily hear people talking about climate denial. Also, you shouldn't come up to somebody and say, hey, do you believe in climate change? Let's have a conversation about this. Um, Oftentimes that's not a great way to, you know, begin a conversation and to find common ground to begin with. But at this point, you know, you don't necessarily hear people openly denying climate change. You do hear, however, concerns about some of the new technologies. And so I'll use the Grain Belt Express as an example. So this is a proposed project to bring wind, wind power through transmission lines into the state and beyond. And there's a lot of talk about concerns related to the human health impacts or animal health impacts of having these transmission lines going through next to a home and things like that. And so oftentimes we're answering questions from a scientific perspective about these concerns. The other thing that we, we see a lot and that I would caution against is um, that it's really important, especially for scientists to be responsible about how they blame climate change for weather events. So with climate change, we know um, we're starting to get a better understanding of the attribution of certain weather events related to climate change, like when we have major flooding events um, or droughts. However, it's irresponsible to say that every flood is caused by climate change alone, because there's a lot of different factors that go into flooding. And so when talking about you know, what climate change is causing, I think it's just really important to be responsible about that information. And finally, um, bipartisan framing. Um, it's again, really good to find common ground, but if you're using bipartisan framing, if you're coming in and talking about you know, how something could have economic benefits, uh, then it's really important to be authentic with that bipartisan framing. So the example um, that Jenny uh, shared with me to share is, you know, when we had the push for more US-based fuels, so we, ta we were talking about that from a security perspective, um, that if we have more domestic fuel production, then that could increase our security in the US, have less reliance on foreign fuels, was sort of a push to get more renewable energy coming from the US. But at the same time, we had a boom in fracking, which led to more fossil fuels. So we were replacing fossil fuels with other fossil fuels. Um, and so that bipartisan framing didn't necessarily work to actually have a climate um, positive outcome. So um, when thinking about those bipartisan solutions, it's really important to just be genuine and authentic and also make sure to bring your priorities to the table or bring these climate priorities to the table. And so I think I'll go ahead and leave it there. Happy to talk about these other policies more in the question and answer period. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna be entering in the into the question phase of this event. And um, I would like to start with asking Sal a question. Um, what do you see as your potential long-term role in preparing your climates for the green jobs workforce? Well, you know, our role is to uh, assist uh, more minorities, women, and justice-involved individuals uh, to take advantage of the uh, exciting careers uh, that can be uh, achieved uh, in this industry. Uh, so we've been doing that for over 40 years, and God willing, we'll do it for at least another 40 years. Uh, our clients deserve to benefit from all of the great investment and development that is happening in this region. Uh, and so that's what we're here to do. 
Great. Thanks so much. Um, and Ashlyn, how do you, how does our need to feed a growing population fit in with the need to implement climate solutions in the food system? Sure. So one of the uh, messages that we hear the most heavily from the ag in industry is uh, we have to feed the world. We have to feed this growing population. Um, but if you look at the commodities that are being produced and all of the land being utilized for those, so much of that goes into meat production, which um, is not a solution for the people of the world who can't afford meat uh, and seldom is it actually staying in the community that it's produced in. Um, there was a report in 2017 by the ETC group. Uh, it's called Who Will Feed Us? And it identified that 70% of the world, uh, including the most hungry and marginalized, is actually fed by a diverse network of small scale producers. And they called that the, um, the peasant food web. Um, I also wanna point out that the pandemic has really revealed just how fragile and sometimes dangerous the corporate uh, vertically integrated system is, which is where the company owns and controls the whole production process. Uh, we saw major bottlenecks and public health issues. Um, and all the while you have these independent local producers and local butcher shops adapting and stepping up to meet demand. And these are the same producers that want to be part of the climate change solution. Um, and they're willing to experiment uh, in their operations to, uh, to help achieve that. So uh, we need more of those small diverse operations that require less heavy input and extraction and more small and medium processing facilities to help support that market. Uh, and then when those thrive, our rural economies thrive as well. Great, thanks so much. And Rachel, I wanted to ask, um, what are the lawmakers in Jefferson City discussing related to climate change and which issues are prioritized for them? Yeah, so I, I realize I kind of covered this in my PowerPoint slides, but um, again, I think, you know, overall, there's a lack of conversation about climate change, but they are talking about issues that are either impacted by climate change, like agriculture, or contributing to climate change, um, or things like energy that are part of the conversation to mitigate climate change. I think that, that right now, um, in thinking about prioritization, um, i I've had conversations, great conversations with lawmakers talking about the science behind climate change and how some of these issues are either impacted by or, or might be um, impacting greenhouse gas emissions. And, and I think at this point, climate change isn't necessarily, you know, as immediate enough of a priority for it to become the main point of the conversation. They're still, you know, they're addressing other concerns from their constituents. They're addressing economic concerns in their districts. Um, and we're not there to tell them, you know, how to prioritize climate science. We're there to make sure that they have all the information possible. Um, but it it does seem like, you know, those other priorities are still ahead of climate. Um, and so we really try to focus on thinking about climate as part of every issue. So, you know, even if they're talking about a health insurance bill, well, there's health impacts of climate change, and that's something that should be brought into the conversation. So instead of, you know, trying to force climate change and force climate as a priority, we try to really highlight how climate is this overarching problem that's affecting everything um, and bring it into multiple uh, conversations. And so I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there since I answered the different topic question in my PowerPoint. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up with one of the questions from one of our attendees. Um, so they were wondering how can researchers and scientists in places um, in other places of the state besides Jefferson City engage with policymakers like you do? Well, that is a really great question and something that we really try to focus on um, by creating opportunities for scientists in other parts of the state. Um, I would say a couple of things. So first of all, state level climate action, even though it's not happening at the state level, there's still a lot going on at the local level, especially if you're based in St. Louis or Kansas City. Um, so getting involved with some of the more local efforts, working with your local policymakers um, can be really effective. Um, you can do that in a lot of different ways by attending commission meetings or city council meetings by, you know, running to be or, or applying to be appointed to a commission. Um, and so lots of ways you can interact in your local communities. The second thing I would say is that 
Missouri is a part-time legislature, which means that our lawmakers are only in Jefferson City for five months every year. The other seven months of the year, they are back home in their own districts. And so there's a lot of opportunities to engage with your elected officials while they're back home between a, June, sorry, <laughs> June and December. Um, and state lawmakers are incredibly accessible. Um, if you're a constituent, reach out to them, find a time to get coffee. Um, I know that's been virtual for a long time. Maybe this summer you can get coffee outside somewhere in your district um, and, and have a conversation with them. It's they're a lot more accessible than you might think. Um, call up their office, email them, and, and find a time to start to get to know them. Great. Thanks so much. Um, we did have a question that was submitted beforehand, um, open to all pa panelists. And uh, this person works at the zoo, um, I'm assuming the St. Louis Zoo. And they were saying that explaining why people should care about climate and how climate change is happening is the easy part during her job. Um, but I'm always looking for concrete solutions for people to get involved at the local community or local or community level. So um, she was wondering if there were, if you panelists had any ideas um, in terms of that and how she can transmit information to the people who are, who are visiting. Well, maybe I, you know, in addition to kind of being civically active and understanding local policies and local things going on in the government, I think there are so many amazing nonprofits and NGOs across our state who are working in this space. Um, and that's something tangible that people can do is volunteer with those organizations, probably volunteer at the zoo is probably another one of those options. Um, but I think that is something, something that's an easy way to direct people is to look for some of those local nonprofits that are working in that space um, and see if they can find volunteer opportunities that way. I would agree. And um, it's kind of a, you have to kind of make a couple of, of jumps uh, <laughs> to see how my recommendations will, will connect to climate change. But I would still just recommend again, finding your farmers and talking with them about what practices they're implementing um, and getting connected to a local food policy council. I know there's a great network in St. Louis if she does, or actually in Kansas City also. So um, yeah, there are some really great organizations there working to, um, to connect people with those farmers, but also uh, build up the um, responsible and sustainable and you know positive impacts that those farmers are making. Great. At Sal, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add. Well, I just, I, I agree uh, with both uh, Rachel and, and, and Ashlyn. Uh, I learn more about this, this um, universe, this, this work uh, every day. And it kind of started with me joining a, um, a small a community garden in North St. Louis. And uh, then we began to be approached by other organizations who were interested in our work, which then led to uh, meeting, you know, lots of great people, working with lots of great organizations, and uh, just that that exposure led to uh, a thirst for more knowledge. So uh, get involved. There's some great people uh, in this industry, and uh, I found them to be wonderful to work with. Great. Thanks so much. Um, now I'm looking through the questions. Um, one question, and I think this is, Rachel, you might be able to answer to this, is are there any coordination efforts across states in sharing research and implementing policies? Yes, um, I think there are a, probably a lot of these different efforts and I might not be knowledgeable of all of them. Um, I'll, I'll first point to Washington University. They've been coordinating a Midwest climate uh, collaborative and Midwest climate dialogues with universities across the Midwest. Um, and Beth could share a lot more about that effort than I can, um, but that's one way. 
uh, for our local science engagement network. Um, so that's funded through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And we're one of the um, first three pilot states for that. So we also work with colleagues in Colorado and Georgia and kind of share best practices of what's working related to climate communication. Um, and then also share resources um, related to, to different scientific topics um, that policymakers are talking about. Great, thanks. Um, and there's a, there's a question for Ashlyn. Um, you spoke about problems with biogas. How do you see interactions with local farmers and other energy options that they might use their land for, like wind turbines or, or growing crops for biofuels? Um, yeah, you could speak to the communications with the local farmers. Sure. So, um, so I've seen examples of, and I really just have to use the word uh, innovators. Um, I've seen uh, some examples of farmers who are doing multiple things, but all work together to um, build that resiliency, but also, you know, uh, help sequester carbon in their soils. So um, agroforestry. So I, I've seen some models where um, farmers are, you know, planting rows of trees uh, with, sorry, I'm not an expert on this part, but I've seen, I've, you know, I've talked to people about it. They plant the, a line of trees, so producing trees, so like, uh, you know, apricots, pecans, things like that, far enough apart, you can still uh, take the tractor down through between the trees to harvest whatever your crop is there, or you're, you're uh, grazing your uh, chickens or, or your, your goats or whatever amongst um, whatever other producing crop that you have. Um, so again, I mentioned the, uh, the agrivoltaics, which I, I'm super interested in this. A colleague shared this article with me um, where uh, there's a study, I believe it's in Oregon. Uh, they had a pilot project and they're, they're gonna follow up on this in an even bigger sense. So he's proposing that, um, uh, I, I'm gonna go find the article and put it in the chat because I can't convey it as well uh, as that article does. But I have to say that, uh, wind turbines is it's really a, a very difficult conversation because while that is um while wind you know that that's a great renewable energy source yes we've got to talk about it but we've also got to figure out like i said how do we include the local community in that because there are still some conversations surrounding wind turbines that are very similar to the conversations we're having about impacts from CAFOs. And so that one's a really difficult one and, and we need to always uh, consider how it's going to impact neighbors and communities. Yeah, I think that's a really valuable point. Um, moving forward, um, I see a question for Rachel, is there a good resource that grades political candidates at the local or state level on their commitment to climate solutions? That's a really great question. Um, at the local or state level, the, you know, what I see is the most common sources of like grading or talking about pol polit political candidate stances is really like the local newspapers. And unless the local newspapers are covering something about climate, um, then I'm not sure that gets covered. Something that we coordinated for the state last year, but only at the federal level was something called the science debate. Um, and we included some questions on climate change. We don't grade them. We're just you know making it more of a resource so that you can look at it, see their answers and kind of know a little bit more about their stances. Um, and I think in the 2022, at the next primary, mm -hmm. we'll try to do that for a local policymaker or local elected officials, local candidates, sorry, as well. Um, but other than that, I don't know of a lot of state resources. Um, there's some state policy or politics-based newspapers that cover a lot of, of issues related to candidates. Um, one is called the Missouri Times, the Missouri Independent. They're both um, not necessarily newspapers you can subscribe to to get to your house, but they do have online newsletters and um, articles they publish daily. And they also cover a lot of um, types of issues about candidates, not necessarily particularly related to climate change, but um, would probably have some information about a candidate's stances. Great, thank you. Um, Sal, I'm wondering, so you've talked about um, implementing or 
how solar training and training for your clients for solar um, has been something that you've been a part of. I'm wondering, or what your organization has been doing. I'm wondering, um, what is your, what are your clients' responses to being, to having access to this cert, this training um, that is also helping with the climate crisis that we're facing? Well, they were, the uh, pilot participants were really thrilled and excited to be introduced to this industry. Uh, many of them had no idea that there were employment opportunities associated with this work. And we're really excited that there was an opportunity for them to do something that was environmentally responsible while putting them in a, in a position to be self-sufficient and to be able to provide uh, for their families. Um, and so we, uh, we already have a waiting list um, of, um, of, of participants for our next cohort. So uh, they went back and told their friends and, and family members and colleagues about um, this exciting uh, industry. And so we're looking forward to uh, launching our, our next cohort in the next few weeks. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Um, do you see any potential in in expanding that, you know, beyond your local organization? Yes, um, we do. There's been, you know, so much positive feedback uh, from just this uh, initial pilot program. We're also in the process of uh, engaging uh, an industry a professional, um, a content expert, if you will, to help us and our partners build this program uh, to a, a stage of, of permanence. We don't want this to be a one and done program or uh, something that, that doesn't endure. Uh, we understand that this is a growing industry. We understand that uh, diversity and inclusion uh, has not been something that uh, has been prioritized uh, in this work. Uh, and so we're here to uh, make sure that those opportunities are made available uh, for um, all people uh, in the community. And so, uh, we definitely see this as a long-term uh, permanent program. We want to expand it to uh, other uh, employment opportunities uh, in the, the green job world. Uh, and so we're, we're just getting started uh, in this regard. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, all right. So Ashlyn, I'm wondering that there is a question that was asking about how do small and local farmers organize to address and fight factory farming? Um, and ha what are their general sentiments around factory, factory farming and these corporations? Sure, so like I, uh, like I mentioned in the presentation there, um, there's this ongoing feud of what the future of farming is for our state and you know, for the nation as well. And so, um, I, I can describe a little bit about how uh, SREP works. So we, we get uh, a request for help from a community um, who has received notice that uh, a CAFO is proposed for their community. And so uh, we follow up with them and uh, we help them understand the regulatory process that they can participate in because if uh, the CAFO is of a certain size, then they can um, provide uh, public comment to the regulatory agency, which is the Department of Natural Resources. Um, and so uh, we also help them educate their neighbors and the surrounding community about the issues. We help them look through the potential impacts to the area, you know, kind of provide this uh, kind of a side analysis so they can know uh, how this is going to impact them. Um, so I can't say that every, that every small uh, or a local farmer feels a certain way. It definitely depends on if uh, the operation proposed is uh, is proposed by a local, um, you know, someone who's been in that community for a long time, um, or if it is proposed by an out of state, uh, even foreign entity. And that's what we see a lot of is a lot of um, non-local uh, ownership of, of CAFOs. Uh, and, and I guess I'll take this opportunity just for a second to talk about why foreign ownership of farmland is is a negative. Um, so there there is a push by foreign countries to purchase Missouri farmland to produce their products. Uh, and so 
then what are we left with? We're left with the manure. Um, the, the product gets exported, we're left with the manure and the impacts to the environment and the impacts to the community. And so um, we, have a, we had a, a law in the state that um, foreign entities couldn't own Missouri farmland. That was changed, uh, I believe, back in 2015 um, uh, to 1%. Uh, foreign uh, entities could own 1% of Missouri farmland. And now there's a bill, like I mentioned in the presentation, uh, to try to curb that and track that again, because um, those entities uh, aren't going to, uh, let me say this this way, non-local ownership of a CAFO doesn't have the investment in the community, isn't accountable to, or doesn't feel accountable to, uh, to the neighbors to implement best practices for them. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I forget what the question was. I hope I answered it. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was very helpful. Um, and I do kind of see the overlap with you and Sal and really focusing on investing in local communities, which I think is a really important aspect to consider when we're addressing this very um, existential issue. Um, there was a question, which I think, Rachel, you might be able to speak to. Um, is there a policy to fund carbon sequestration research? Policy to fund carbon sequestration research. So there are, there's been legislation that was proposed in the 116th Congress. I don't think it's been reintroduced in the current Congress in DC. Uh, so let me talk about DC first. Um, that would fund carbon markets for farmers and really not necessarily fund car carbon markets. They would fund some technical support so that farmers and forest owners could participate in carbon markets um, and get payments for sequestering carbon based on their management practices on their land. Um, as far as research goes, I think that coming from this conversation as a soil scientist and being part of a lot of these conversations in the soil science community, I think that there is a big push for funding more research related to carbon sequestration potential. Um, so that way it's not something that we're you know, coming out and over-promising as a solution to climate change because some soils, you know, even though they can sequester soil, there's a some sort of inherent property limit on that soil, um, especially associated with land management practices um, that is going to cause that soil not to maybe be able to sequester as much as we might hope. Um, and so I think that research is a, should be a priority related to carbon sequestration in soils. Um, and I don't know of policies specifically that are supporting that, but I would say that I, I'm guessing it's going to be a huge priority in the appropriations for USDA research funding this next round. Um, I don't remember what AFRI funding is at for this next um, cycle or if they've even put out appropriations yet, but I think that that's probably going to be a priority for ag researchers and soil science researchers in the coming, coming years. Thank you. Um, so Sal, I do have a, a, a question. Um, what key policy do you think is important for Missouri moving forward with a green recovery, um, with climate solutions and a just transition? And do you have any ideas for how our attendees can specifically, um, take action themselves? Well, I think as it relates to our role of increasing, uh, diversity and inclusion in this industry, uh, I'm a firm believer that, um, uh, participation goals should be established, uh, particularly on publicly supported projects, uh, you know, locally in construction, um, you will see uh, minority participation goals, um, women participation goals, local workforce participation goals placed on construction projects. And so I think the same thing should be replicated uh, in this industry, uh, even pushed. I think the, the number should be 35 to, to 40%. Um, I think this is a win-win uh, for all uh, players in this industry, uh, for the unions, for private businesses, uh, for the communities uh, who need an injection of uh, economic development and uh, need more individuals that are contributing to the tax base. So uh, if we're going to be serious about uh, creating access and equity uh, in this industry, then we've got to establish goals and we've got to enforce those goals, uh, make sure that everyone is giving it their all uh, so that um, everyone can participate 
uh, in this in this great effort. Great, thank you. Um, and looking through the questions, it, I was hoping maybe I know both Ashlyn and Rachel spoke to biogas, but there seems to be some a little confusion. So I was just hoping you kind of clarify because the, the the general um, the general facts about biogas um, and how they particularly pertain to what you you are interested in. You want to tackle that one, Rachel? <laughs> I mean, I'll I'll let you start, and I'll fill in anything that I've been talking about related to biogas that might might help. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so my my focus was specifically on the biogas generated from CAFOs and their manure generation, uh, and so I think biogas encompasses a larger um, a larger source than that, lar many more sources than that. So I'll let Rachel talk about those because I'm not the authority on those. Well, actually, I would say, um, so I think a bill recently passed out of the Senate to be able to support renewable natural gas um, and renewable natural gas they're calling, it's essentially biogas that's coming off of manure and, and livestock facilities. Um, from my understanding, so short-term benefits. So right now those manure piles are releasing a lot of methane into the atmosphere and trapping that biogas and um, being able to use, trapping those gases, being able to use them as a potential fuel source is you know, potentially a good situation because now we're not releasing that methane into the atmosphere. However, it's a short-term solution, right? So there's a lot of other potential challenges or not potential, there's a lot of other realized challenges with CAFOs that are um, facing the communities where they're located. And so, um, it's a, it's a solution to being able to curb some of the effects of CAFOs on climate, but not necessarily a long-term solution. And so that's more the conversations that we would be having is saying, you know, this is a, you know, something that is going to decrease emissions, but we want to look holistically at the like footprint of this operation to begin with um, and what that means related to climate change and how that compares. So especially what we do is compare it to like other fuel sources and other gas sources um, that may be present in the state, not just, you know, based on economic perspectives, but we really focus in on like the carbon footprint of those different fuel sources um, and thinking about how a, I don't actually know what biogas is used for, what you end, what's the end product as it goes in, in like a, a fuel cell vehicle, or <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. But um, so if that's the case, we might compare it to like a hydrogen fuel or so, another type of like gas-based fuel and and what the carbon emissions and environmental footprint look like on those different types of fuels. So they, the, I think that there probably are different methods of utilizing it, but um, what we're seeing uh, with certain projects in Missouri are pipelines um, being built to transport the gas that's produced. Um, I am, so actually, if we could talk about that for a second, Rachel. So that bill, I was trying to follow that as well. Do I understand correctly that it um, it is, it's basically telling the, oh, it's telling a certain commission, um, to promulgate rules surrounding, um, biogas. Is that, is that correct? I, yes. I think it was bringing biogas or renewable natural gas, um, into the folds that of energy sources that would typically be regulated maybe by the public service commission. I'm not yep. sure, yep. but yeah, I think, I think, I do think it was related to that. It popped up on my radar, like after it got passed, I didn't see it going through. So I don't know too much about it. Uh, no, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's a, that will create a new uh, method for public participation. Um, because if they're telling a, a, an agency, you have to develop these rules surrounding this, then the public will have the ability to provide comments for those rules. I don't know if they would hold stakeholder meetings as well, um, but that, that's another way to get involved in how, how we uh, regulate this proposed climate solution. Thank you. So we only have a few more minutes um, and I wanted to ask a concluding question to all of you. Um, we know that climate change can be is a very daunting um, threat, but I, I wanted to ask what are if I just wanted to end the conversation on more of a, a positive note. So what are what is a an, very, an actionable item that every panelist can take away from this um, from this discussion 
um, to feel that they can contribute to helping with the crisis. I can go first because I already covered mine a little bit. Uh, seek out those producers that are trying to implement um, solutions, trying to uh, experiment, willing to experiment, and that are um, that are responsible to their community, that are supporting their community with good jobs, good food. Seek them out and support them. And if there are um, barriers in the way, figure those out and help uh, talk with uh, policymakers about those. So I would say um, get to know people who don't have the same opinions as you and try to learn how to have effective conversations on climate change, knowing that it's going to be awkward and it's going to be hard at first, um, but really trying to find that common ground and being able to, you know, find shared interests and things that bring you together is really being able to have those conversations is the only way we're going to be able to garner bipartisan support and move climate solutions forward at the state level, I think. And I agree with that. I think uh, we need to all be more engaged uh, at the local, state, and, and federal levels. I think sometimes people forget that uh, our public servants work for us. Uh, we put them in office. We certainly should have respect for them, uh, but we need to voice our opinions. Uh, we need to get involved with organizations that uh, support our ideas, um, our agendas, our priorities. Uh, their strength in numbers. Uh, and so we need to um, keep our eyes on the prize, so to speak, and uh, push for the change that we want to see. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, it was a really great discussion. You all had some really, really important input, and I definitely learned a lot. So I'm, and I'm very, also very grateful for all the work that you do as well. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want to help kind of finish this off. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to. So I just also wanted to reiterate my thanks to all of you for being here and for all of you that are that are listening and watching and thinking about individual actions that you can take and um, impacts that you can have in your community and across the state. So we appreciate you all being here. Um, just as a, a a heads up, we will have this posted on our uh, website at climatechange.wistle.edu, as well as we have um, recordings of other events that we've had with, uh, with our speaker series and our climate conversation series. So um, feel free to check that out. And um, again, thank you all for being with us this evening. Have a good night. <laughs>